Dr. Jeanine Marie Saint Jean, uh, Variability and Trends in Western Canadian Rivers. Okay, thank you all for coming today to listen to me. So, uh, first of all, I'd like to talk a bit about global warming. We've all heard about it in the news, we all have some sense of what it is. And usually, the best way to bring it home to, you, to anybody is to show that how much we're already seeing when it's happening. So this is uh, the Muir Glacier in Alaska. This is a photograph in 1941. Over here is a 2004 shot, exactly the same. You can, if, you, if you sit and you look at it, the peaks will line up, and you can see how much that glacier has receded. So global warming is definitely occurring now. Uh, the physics behind it, or the ideas behind it, are certainly not new. The basic physics was figured out in the, eight, in the 18th century with Joseph Fourier and back even before 1830 and Arrhenius was the turn of that, that century. And basically the idea is, is we're pumping all these greenhouse gases into the air and they are holding in the heat of the planet and making it warmer. So what I have here is concentration of greenhouse gases for the past 2,000 years. The red line is CO2, which is one of our major gases. And you can see how it's gone steadily along from about 200 to 80. And then the last century, it's just shot up. to we've gone from 280 to we're getting very close to 300 parts per million. And we're definitely going to blow past there. There's no doubt about it. We're not going to get our act together. And sort of an obvious question that anybody might have is, is, gee, people have been running around with instruments for the past 2,000 years. How do we know this? And the answer is actually fairly simple. What people have done is, is they've gone to the Greenland ice cap, or to the ice cap in Antarctica, and they've taken a core of the ice. And as the snow is falling, it's trapping air bubbles. So as that all freezes and as the snow turns to ice and it becomes that solid ice sheet, there's air bubbles trapped in the ice. So if you carefully take a core, you slice it up, you take those slices back to the lab, you melt each slice in a vacuum, the air that you're getting off is the air of that time. So that's how we know what it was. And then one other, so we really messed, messed things up quite thoroughly, but one other thing I'd like to bring, bring your attention to is this dip that's going on there at, six, at about 1600. What that is, is that's the epidemics coming through the Americas, the epidemics brought by the Europeans. And there's been so much death due to smallpox and the other epidemic diseases that came through that people didn't have the immunity to, that there's that many people have died, that many fields have gone back to forest, the forests have grown in the fields, and as the trees grew, they took down the CO2 and have lowered the CO2 level of the plant. So. Very controversial, as you can imagine, the, the political implications of that one. So if we just, but the instrumental records have been very short instrumentation. Uh, thermometers and things like that, the Paris record goes back to about 1650. But we really only had worldwide coverage in a decent shape of the instrumental records starting around 1850. So if you take, if you, so we're starting around 1860, and we're showing what this is is a worldwide average, or yeah, that's worldwide average. And what I'm showing here is, is departures from the 1961 to 1990 average. It's not an absolute temperature. But as you can see, that if you just have a smoothing line on it, that we've just gone from cold up to warmer, and we've just gone, it's been a pretty linear trend going up. It's about a degree Celsius, and to move the temperature of the planet a degree Celsius, on average, that's a huge change. And if we look at what temperatures have been over the past thousand years, we can tell what temperatures have been, for instance, by what we call proxy records. So as organisms grow, they will record temperature in the, in the course of their growing. And then we can go look at the remnants of their, of their bodies and figure out what the temperature was. For instance, if you take a tree that's growing up a tree line, well, if it's a warm year, it'll put on a thick, thick tree ring. If it's a cold year, it's not going to put on much of a ring at all. So people have gone around, and they've gone up the mountains, and they've sampled trees from all over the planet. And this is what mainly this is a tree ring record with a little bit of pollen in it. I'll talk more about it. So it's past 1,000 years, and it's departures in temperature, once again, from the average. 
And we can see there's a bit of a warm spell from about 1,000 to about 1,300, 1,400. It dips a bit cooler. And then once we get into the Industrial Revolution, when we start burning all that coal in a large quantity, the petroleum, the natural gas, in large quantities, I mean, people have been burning coal for a very long time. For instance, back a 1,000 years ago in the Four Corners area, the ancestral Pueblos were firing their pottery with coal. It's an area where there's coal deposits right on the surface. And while well, people were using it, also people were using coal in China, but they weren't burning a huge amount of it like we are now. And then you can see starting around 1850, the Industrial Revolution is going, temperatures have just shot up. So. I'll get you to stay a little bit closer to the okay. screen. Yeah. Uh, and then it's always nice to know what's going on in your own particular area. So this is the instrumental temperature from, for Regina. The instrumental record at Regina begins around 1885 when the railways came through. Uh, this temperature record is showing mean annual temperature from 1901 to uh, 2010. And you can see it's just gone up. I can do various statistical tests. I can put a trend line on it. I'll tell you, it's, hi it's a highly significant increase in warmth of about 2 degrees Celsius for just here. So if you're listening to older people who are grumbling, well, we're not getting winters like quite like we used to, they're right. Now, with the warming of the planet, we'll also be getting changes in the water cycle. So areas that are dry today will become drier. Areas that are wet today are going to become even wetter. This is because warmer air can hold more water vapor. It's something you all, or certainly I know, and many of you know, you know in the, in the middle of winter when it's 30 or 20 below outside. I don't know about you, but I'm running around with a nosebleed all the time. The air's so dry, my nose is just bleeding. Summertime, the weather warms up, my nosebleeds go away, and I'm not the only person who's grumbling that, because that warmer air is holding a lot more water vapor. So what I'm showing you here is a uh, map of the planet, and I'll have a number of maps as I go through the top. Wherever things are blue or, or green, that's saying wet conditions. When things are tan or red or orange or yellow, that's meaning dry conditions. So what this is, is this is what we expect percentage change in precipitation, summer precipitation, for the end of this century. And what it is, is this is the latest IPCC-5. So people have taken the latest global climate models, taken a big average of them, and saying, this is what we think the future is going to be like. So you can see that some areas, like the Me Mexico, the Southwest, the Caribbean, the Mediterranean, are going to be coming much drier in summer. And this is a serious concern for people in these areas because they're already stressed for water. Other areas like the North, the NWT, are going to become, it's going to become wetter. That warmer air is able to carry more moisture up to the North. And then if you look where we are here, we're right above <coughs> the Northern Great Plains, the Canadian prairies are right about here. Uh, Southern Alberta, it's looking like we're going to become drier, where it becomes the stippled marks here. That's where the models are disagreeing. We're not quite sure what's going to happen. But it looks like the southern Great Plains, in particular the southwestern corner, is going to become drier in the summer. So this is some work um, my colleagues and I did that we just got accepted in the Canadian Journal of Water Resources. And if there's such major changes going on, and we see the big changes in the glacier, we see those changes in the temperature, shouldn't we be seeing these changes already maybe in this area? So what I did is I took 86 uh, river records from throughout the prairies. I'm trying to get them throughout the prairies the best coverage possible. And I'm trying to take the longest ones. And I'm seeing, are there changes in that, in, in the water that's coming down in the rivers and the streams? And this legend is pretty simple. If there's a red down arrow, we're seeing decreases in those rivers. Blue up arrow, like what we have over here in Manitoba, increases in those rivers. So Alberta is going down. Southwestern Saskatchewan is going down, and if there's just that uh, black square, no trend whatsoever, no changes that we can tell. So this is what's going on, but if you talk to elders, if you talk to people who've lived here for a while, they will tell you that the climate here is actually quite variable. If you've just lived here, if you've moved in from elsewhere, if you just lived here for a little while, you get a sense of how variable the climate is, as I mean, Everybody is sort of used to a 30 degree temperature change in about two, two days. We can go from below zero up to about 25. And so we do, it is a highly variable climate regime. And one of the things 
you'll certainly hear the weather person talk about is they'll be mumbling something about for each winter whether it's El Nino or La Nina, and this will have uh, this will tell us something about what winter will be. So if we're if we have an El Nino here, and El Nino and La Nina is the state of the ocean and the air masses on the equatorial Pacific, so it's a long ways away, but the Pacific covers half of the planet. So if water masses and air masses really change there, that's going to change, that'll have worldwide implications for the weather. So for us, when we have an El Nino event, this is when a pool of warm water sloshes the eastern <coughs> we end up with a warm, dry winter. The Pacific jet stream, that where our storm tracks are followed along that Pacific jet stream, it swings around to the south. This is where the storm tracks all originate. California gets flooded out, they get all the landslides, they're complaining, we have a very warm, dry winter. When we switch from El Nino to sister La Nina, then the jet stream swings up, it comes over our heads, this is where the storm track follows, we have a very heavy storm track that winter, we get a lot of snow, and it's a cold winter. So, but this is, this will happen for, this will set in for a year, for a winter, maybe a couple of years at the most. These aren't very long-lasting phenomena, but it turns out what a lot of our weather is dominated by is something different, something going on in the North Pacific called the Pacific Decadal Oscillation of the PDO. Sorry, it'll just ring. And what the PDO is, is we have a pool when the PDO is in its warm phase, we have a pool of cold water in the, in the North Pacific, warm water off the coast. In this case, that jet stream that we, we, that we rely on for our winter snowpack, it swings around to the south and hits California. We lose a lot of our winter storms. If you've been here for winter, you, you get a sense of, I mean, our winter wind is usually always coming out of the west. It's a cold west wind. So we are de definitely downstream of the North Pacific. If we're in the cold phase of the PDO, what happens is, is that the pattern switches. We have a warm puddle in the North Pacific, cool water off the coast, the jet stream comes right overhead. We have a lot of storms in the winter, a lot of snowpack, the rivers run high, the lakes run high. Now the PDO, it's on, unlike El Nino or La Nina, that's sort of a, an annual time life. The PDO is on about a 60 year cycle. So when Europeans first started settling this area from about 1900 to 1925, the PDO is actually in a neg negative PDO phase. So a lot of snowpack, rivers are running high. Europeans ended up thinking that this is actually a fairly wet climate regime. Then, 20, uh, 25, 1925, we switch into the positive phase PDO, drier winters. It's that winter snowpack that we rely on to refill the rivers and the lakes. This is when the dirty 30s occur. So from 1925 to 1946, positive PDO phase, not much snow in winter, we've got, we've got the dirty 30s, rivers and lakes are low. Uh, 47 through 76, PDO goes negative, a lot of high snowpack, rivers are high, lakes are high. 77, we switch into the positive PDO, we have, we have a bunch of bad droughts in this time period, and then finally in 2008, we're into a negative PDO again, so I'm afraid expect sort of cold, a lot of snow winters probably for about the next 25 years. Then it switches. And what I did is I took those 86 rivers and I wanted to see, I'm not going into the statistical detail of what I did, I just wanted to see is can, can we see the fingerprint of the PDO in these rivers? And it turns out across the prairies we do see it. We see it throughout all of Alberta. We, it was known that it was in southern Alberta, but we, our paper found that we also see its impact in northern Alberta, throughout Saskatchewan, and even in southern Manitoba. Uh, and then, well, we start wondering about what's going on. We, we start wondering about what's going on with trends. Here we get into, so this is just a repeat of the previous slide. So we've got all these trends going down in the river flow in northern Alberta, but we have a problem there. The gauge records haven't been in there for very long. So these records were all put in starting around 1950. 
So the problem is, is we know the PDO really affects this area. But in 1950, the PDO was in a negative phase, but it was until, nine, until 76. So uh, PDO is negative, so we've got a lot of snowpack. We've got a lot, of, a lot of water in the landscape. The rivers are high. Then we switch into that positive phase PDO, the rivers decline. Of course, you're going to be seeing a declining trend. But it's not global warming. It's just PDO. However, there are some records that are about 100 years in length. These are the records in southern Alberta and in southwestern Saskatchewan. These are 100 years long. These are all showing the decline. So this decline in this area, it's probably global warming. It's not just the PDO. So these areas are in real trouble. And they're already very dry and very reliant on irrigation. So that's work I do with the instrumental data that's out there. I do do some work with, with uh, global climate model data. I don't program them. That's an art form, very arcane in itself. Uh, but I do work with the data, and they produce an awful lot of data. So what a GCM is, or a global climate model is, is the planet and its oceans and its atmosphere and the land are chopped up in these little grid cells. And it's run as a huge program. And when they, when they do one of these runs, they can go for a year. And they run on the fastest computer. Available. And what we try to simulate is all the processes that are going in forming weather and climate. So clouds, the ocean, the Gulf Stream, precipitation, rainfall, snowfall, water running off the continent into the ocean, water evaporating back up. So all this is built in. And the data is there. And what I did is, is in a paper I published in Quaternion International, is, is we wanted to forecast what the flows, river flows would be in that bad corner that we're worried about in southern Alberta. So this is Old Man at Lethbridge. We did a bunch of rivers. Um, we have a lot of jargon if you work with GCMs. We don't say forecast river. It's not quite a forecast. We call it a projected flow. But what the red is, so this is 1900 through to 2100. The red is the actual flow we're seeing at Old Man River at Lethbridge. You can see that there's a trend down. An individual gray line is as a run of a GCM under certain conditions. That's what we call spaghetti. Sorry, it's our technical term. We do call it spaghetti. And you can see it really looks like spaghetti. But the blue is a mean of all the spaghetti. And you can see that it's showing that trends are going down. Until when we get up to 2100, we're starting to look at a possibility of no, no water in the river at all. And then, so <coughs> definitely possibly seeing changes due to global warming in the southern part of the, part of the prairies. But we also see changes, I mentioned when I showed you that uh, map from the IPCC, that the NWT should be seeing uh, wetter conditions. And this is another paper I, did, uh, I worked, published in Geophysical Research Letters, in which I took the longest river records out of the NWT, and I wanted to see are there changes going on there. And what we found was throughout the NWT, flow in winter is going up in the rivers. And if we pick the southernmost rivers, these were seeing flow increasing throughout the entire year. So what we think that partly is this is that hydrological cycle intensification, that the warmer air is able to carry more water from the oceans, where it then either rains or snows out in this area. But also, we think this is also in part due to the permafrost is, is melting. Is degrading. So that's that. So changes all over. Now, the instrumental records really only go back to when the railway came in, if you're really lucky, so around 1885. What happened before that? Here's where we get into tree ring records. So in our area, trees are recording usually moisture conditions. So basically, if so, if you take a biscuit, you polish it up, you take, pack it off with a chainsaw, you smooth it up, sand it up nice fine grip sandpaper, and we scan it. We look at it under a scanner or my dissecting microscope. And basically, if it's a wet year, the tree's able to grow a lot. So it'll put on a thick year. So nice wet year right here. If it's a really bad droughty year, the tree really doesn't grow much. It may not even put on a ring at all. So those are those really fine rings here that you can, you can barely make out. So from this, we can take a whole bunch of tree ring records. We either take dead trees, or we can take a small core that's thinner than a pencil from a live tree. It's not really any different from an insect boring. 
as long as we don't do it too much, we won't hurt the tree. So we can take a whole bunch of these tree ring records and average them together to make sure we're just not, if we just base it on one record, we might have a funny tree that's growing in funny conditions. But we can take a big average. And that gives us a pretty good sense of what's going on with precipitation in the prairies. This is my boss, Dave Sashin. He's a bit of a madman, as you can see, with a chainsaw. I think this might be Doug Fur, I'm not sure. He's just chopped out a biscuit, and he's feeling very happy with himself. He's thinking that's going to be a good record. So we take all these cores and these biscuits. We take them back to the lab. This is Samantha, one of our grad students. It makes a dreadful mess, because we have to sand them, sand them, polish them, so we can see them clearly and count. So she's making her mess there. And this is a reconstruction of the flow of the North Saskatchewan River for the past 1,000 years. And what we're doing here is, is if it's blue, flow is higher than the mean for the 1900s. If it's red, flow is lower than the mean for the 1900s. And if you look right here, this little red dip here, this is the dirty 30s. And then that's just a little red dip, but you compare it to what it was like in the past, and you can see that, gee, the dirty 30s wasn't really much of a drought in comparison to what the region has seen in the past. Also, if you look right here around 1900, there's this big clump of blue. It's the biggest patch of blue throughout the full thousand years. So once again, when the Europeans were settling, they were settling in this extreme wet period. They thought the climate was warmer, or was wetter than it was. And they based their decisions, many of their decisions, on that. It really wasn't a great idea. So using these long tree ring records, what we've had is we've compared them to colleagues, uh, long PDO records, uh, the Pacific Decay Oscillation, that they built from another area based on tree rings. And what we find is, is that three quarters of the long droughts in the past 600 years are occurring in the positive PEO phase. So that pattern of droughts that we saw that in the dirty 30s that we're more likely to see those severe droughts, that pat in when the PEO is positive, that pattern has held throughout the past 600 years. And okay, nice dirty 30 shot. You've seen a lot of these. This is from the Mennonite archives. So. Everybody who's grown up here has heard lots of stories of the dirty 30s from their, their elders, their grandparents, their parents. If you've moved into the area, you will hear stories, trust me. And so that was a very bad decade. But what we're coming to appreciate based on pooling everybody's tree ring records from across the continent, that that decade-long drought was a short drought. Okay, by pooling all these tree ring records across Great Turtle Island, we're coming to realize that that drought, that 10 year drought of the dirty 30s, that's a short one. What North America is a very <coughs> drought prone climate, uh, continent because of that chain of the Rocky Mountains that blocks a lot of the moisture coming across from the Pacific. So what we found by pooling the tree ring records is, is that it's not unusual that we have one of these big droughts that's continental in scale that lasts for 20 years. 30 years, 50 years, 100 years. So what I'm showing here is, is one of the Mississippian mega droughts. This is from 1340 to 1400. And you can see that it's just locked. This is an average. So red or yellow means that we're into a drought conditions. The blue means we're into wetter than normal conditions. It just locked in that central Mississippi Valley. For it's actually, it starts around 13, 1300. So very bad time here. But you can see it also comes up into, northern, into Canada, into the northern part of the Great Plains. So if we go back to Dave's tree ring record, if this is the 1300s, I've boxed it out. You can see that there's really very little blue in that time period. So flow is always, pretty much always, below normal. Uh, so that's what's going on in the western part of the Canadian prairies. I'd like to switch to the eastern part of the Canadian prairies. So this is using a different proxy. This is using pollen that's um, preserved in, in, in mud in lake cores. So this is, we're out on the ice and we're trying to take a sediment core out of the lake. Uh, winter, working in winter is nice because you don't have to deal with bears or mosquitoes, which is appreciated. So here's a, a core, so a mud taken from a deep hole in the lake. So the top, the mud at the top is what was deposited just this year. And then if we go deeper in it, 
the mod here has to be older than that mod, and then the mod at the bottom has to be older still. So we carefully take the core without disturbing it, we slice it up, and then we have a record in increase going back in time. And then depending on what we're looking at in the mud for our proxy to be able to infer climate, we then spend a lot of time counting that under the microscope. So what I'm, the pollen works very well in this area, and basically if it's warm, the oaks in the area will do well, so we'll get more oak pollen. If it's cold, things like pine or spruce or, vet or birch will be doing well because those are the boreal forest trees and they do well. And then of course, you pick up a nice moisture signal here. When it's dry, we'll see a lot of grass, a lot of sage breast, a lot of sunflower, things like that. And pollen is nice in that not, not, maybe not necessarily every species of plant has its distinct pollen, but certainly um, like all the oaks will have a distinct pollen. And then if it's wet, of course, in this area, well, we won't see much of the grasses or things like that. We'll see the trees. We'll see um, Manitoba maple. We'll see ash and things like that. So out of that, we can get a pretty nice uh, both temperature and moisture record. So I lied a bit. Um, Manitoba's up here. I'm actually 300 kilometers to the south. This is a bunch of work I did. It's a lake called Lake Mina. And it's at a nice place because it's right on the edge between the prairies and the forest so it can pick up a, a moisture signal, because depending on what conditions are, the prairie, if it's dry, the prairie attack, the, the grasses and the sagebrush will do better than the trees. And if it's wet, the trees will be coming growing onto the prairies. And it's also nice because it's right on the edge between the northern coniferous forest, so the pines and the spruce and the, and the birch, and the oak forest in the south. So it's this ladle-shaped lake. There's a deep hole of about 37 meters. And that hole is deep enough and steep sided enough that the water at the bottom is stagnant. There's no oxygen in it, so there's no critter stirring up the mud. So it's totally dead at the bottom. And as the mud falls and is deposited during the year, the, the, the color of the mud changes. In the winter and the spring, it'll be a dark mud. And then in the summertime, it becomes a light mud. So to date, to date your samples, all you have to do is take a core carefully without smushing, all, smushing it all up, and you just count those stripes down. You don't have to deal with radiocarbon or anything like that. Just count stripes. And so if we want to go, so what we do see here is, is that 1300s mega drought that we saw so clearly in the tree ring record in Alberta. If we come off to the eastern side of the Canadian prairies, and in fact, we see it in the pollen record from Nina, that, so this is, so I'm counting down, counting samples. So I counted back from 1900 to 1100 AD. And this is the annual layer thickness, so those stripes that are going down, so how thick they are. In the 1300s, the mud changes, and it, it's the only time in the core in that the mud starts looking like the mud, the sandy, light-colored mud that we had in the dirty 30s. The lake is drying down, it's so dry, and all the sand is washing in. And also, if we look at the pollen at that time, that's when we see the grass spikes in, the sagebrush spikes in, all those prairie plants that we'd expect. And the trees don't do well. If we look at just the total number of tree pollen grains that are in the sediments at the time, they just collapse. There's this big bite out of it. So we really see the drought going on there. And um, I am Métis, so unlike my colleagues, when we see this stuff, I'm always, when we see the climate records going, I'm always going, hey, there were people back then, they're trying to make a living, how do they deal with it? They had to somehow cope with it. And so what this is, one of the plots again, this is um, AD 1320. So Nina is right there, that blue dot, and then this red star right here is throughout the 1100s and the 1200s, the Arakara, the Hadatsa, and the Mandan are starting to farm maize in the floodplain in the Missouri River Valley. Because, I mean, as the sediments wash down each spring, you get your natural fertilizer, the river, the river rising also does all your land clearance for you. It's easy to farm in the floodplains. So people are, bringing, are farming maize at this time. And around 1325, so in the midst of this bad, bad, bad mega drought, there was uh, an Arakara village at uh, the Crow Creek site. 
and it was fortified. So they're building it on the bluffs, so they're protected by the bluffs. And on the open side, they built uh, a palisade and a dike. And it's sort of a bit disturbing to read it. It's a bit grim reading. But the village was wiped out at around 1325, and there's about 500 fatalities. And from the skeletons, if you're starving for a long time, that'll leave marks in your bones, the anemia that you'll be, that you'll be suffering from. It'll change your bones. So people can tell, archaeologists can tell, that people have been starving for a long time. And also, this wasn't the first time that warfare had occurred, that also there's a lot of injuries in people that are just clearly coming about from the sort of injuries you get from uh, warfare. So times are very hard, politics is normal, that will allow us to settle our disputes reasonably, amicably. It's broken down and people are fighting. So climate doesn't determine people's behavior, but it gives you a problem you have to solve. So how did people deal with it? Well, that was one sad case in which people didn't deal with it very well. But people, native people have been living in the prairies for a very long time. And people do remember and did know that the climate is very variable. So one of the ways they coped with it is certainly the Blackfeet and the Plains Assiniboine had an absolute ban on hunting beaver for a long time. And when La Verne Andre is out here in 1738, he's trying to convince certainly the Plains of Centerboy to take part in the fur trade to hunt beaver for him. They're telling him to go take a hike. And what people knew if they were living on the prairies is, is that the climate can throw up these long droughts. And at that time, what everybody is reliant upon is the beavers. If you have a lot of beavers in the landscape, what do beavers do? They build dams like mad. They're beavers. So they're, building, they're putting in basically natural dams and reservoirs everywhere. It's these reservoirs that people and everybody else in the landscape are relying on in the dry years. So a nice example of traditional uh, ecological knowledge in which people knew, it, knew the landscape. And this also is one of the re this also would back into uh, back up why the Métis living on the prairies, why they're doing their land allotment, why they're doing those long strips coming in off of the rivers, they're making sure that if you held land, you were off a major river, that's your transport, but also it's when, when you're in the dry years, that's your water source, because the big rivers, the Saskatchewan, is not gonna dry up. So that way, everybody would have access to one, to transport and to a water supply in the bad years. And then the English came through with that grid system that they put in that's really not suited for the landscape at all. So one last thing I'd like to talk about is th these, the medieval warm period and the little ice age, they were to, these climate regimes were first defined for Europe, but Europe is on just on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean from Great Turtle Island. So basically from around 800 AD to around 1300 AD, Europe experienced what was called the medieval warm period. Climate is warmer than usual, population is expanding, people are able to expand agriculture into areas that they couldn't grow before. And this is the time of the cathedrals, the big castles. There's this big cultural explosion. And then in the 1300s, by certainly about 1400, things change. The climate becomes a lot norm uh, colder. Agriculture fails in a lot of areas. The glaciers start advancing in the mountains, in the Alps, and in the Pyrenees, and Scandinavia. And we know this because people are sketching it. And also, it's recorded in the documentary evidence. Winter becomes longer. And this is when the, green, the Viking colonies in Greenland collapse. They, they're gone by 1420. They can't survive. So that's what's happening in Europe. And at the time, over this period of time, population falls by about half. And warfare really intensifies. So what's going on on the other side of the Atlantic? If we go back to Mina, if we start looking at the changes between um, the, the birch and the spruce and the pine, versus the oak, what we see is, is we do have that distinct medieval warm period. So from February, uh, this is February mean temperature that we derived from pollen. So from around 1100 to about 1450, we have a warm period. Then we go into the cold of the Little Ice Age. And also in the medieval warm period, we have this big efflorescence of native cultures. Maize cultivation is expanding to the north, out of the south. And this is the time in which we have uh, the ancestral pueblos in Chapel Canyon, 
We have the Hohokam building their huge irrigation networks in the Arizona desert. These irrigation networks were the biggest anywhere in the Americas, certainly bigger than anything in Mesoamerica, and they've only been superseded by the big irrigation works put in by the Europeans now that's the source of our winter vegetables in the Arizona desert. The Kime also, and then in the southeast, and this is what's going on in the southwest, but in the southeast we have this big explosion starting around 1050 AD of Cahokia, which is the founding city or, or kingdom of the Mississippian civilization. Here's an artist's edition of Cahokia. So it is this huge state that appears out of nowhere. Um, this is an artist's rendition of the capital, what the capital is like. It's, you can see that it's very Mesoamerican. You've got pyramids built around the pyramids built around the central plazas. Population is around 10 or 20,000 at the time. This is the same population of Paris at the time. Okay, so the Mississippian civilization, it's starting in around 1050 in Cahokia, which is the, the capital of the kingdom. And it's just the ideas, the culture is spreading. It's spreading up to the north, the Oneota Sioux, but it's also spreading throughout the southeast. And this is the founding culture, the founding city the southern ceremonial complex, the southeast, southeastern ceremonial complex. And it's, it was a kingdom. The art is fantastic. It's, it's based on intensive maize, maize cultivation. And with the maize cultivation is coming in a suite of religious ideas. And it's, certainly people are worshiping a corn mother who they're associating with the evening star. And the founder of the dynasty, stories are still told about him, Redhorn, who's associated with the Evening Star, or the Thunderbird, and he's one of two hero twins. And the art of this whole Mississippian culture is absolutely fantastic. I unfortunately don't have signs of it, or time to show you much of it. But you can see here, this is this engraved copper plate of the Thunderbird. So people are starting to work in copper. Um, Pottery is fantastic. It's very, there's certainly clear Mesoamerican ideas. It's not just the plaza and the pyramids around the plaza, but you've got the association of Venus with war, you've got hero twins, you've got the world tree, various other ideas that definitely have a flavor, Mesoamerican flavor. Uh, anyway, cultural artifacts or art is found throughout the entire Mississippi Valley. So people were fascinated by these cultural ideas and the ideas took off. It's, it was certainly a dynasty. They certainly played the Game of Thrones quite seriously. They did manage to um, execute various lineages. And it certainly was a military power. Um, anyway, so these ideas spread throughout. And then if we get to the Four Corners area, so we're getting into the Southwest, so we're looking at the ancestral Pueblos. So if Cahokia is starting from about 1050, and going through until about 1250 where it's finished off, or one of the things that's helped finishing off, Cahokia is one of these Mississippian megadroves. So the ancestral Pueblos, or the Anasazi, they're also called, following the Navajo terminology. They're starting, the big efflorescence is starting around 1100 or going to 1500. <coughs> so it first starts, the capital is in Chaco Canyon, and the hinterland, they built these huge roads, that, so there's all these palaces of the, the great houses. For instance, this is Pueblo Benito. That there's about 15 or 20 of them in Chaco Canyon. And then the roads are, working, are going up to the periphery, so these yellow lines are some of the roads that are spreading out. So maize is coming in from the outliers into Chaco, and then other things are coming out. So it first starts in Chaco, and then it migrates north to Aztec, and then as things start breaking down, it's no longer. So whatever Chaco state was, is it gave people peace. So people are now, are at, the, at the beginning of it, are living in isolated farmsteads. They're not living behind walls. And then as things start breaking down towards the end, they start building the famous cliff dwellings, which, as you can see, are highly fortified and watchtowers. And they're, this is actually up on a cliff. Um, so that's the end. Um, they're tied to Mesoamerica by the Turquoise Trail. So the Mesoamericans, this is the Coltecs, the Mayans, uh, finally the Aztecs, were fascinated by turquoise. And they really used it a lot in their art. 
This is Aztec art. This is actually Bohokam. But if you're seeing turquoise in Mesoamerican art, it's usually it's coming from this area, the four corners. This is the source of the gem quality stones. So it's about 200, uh, 15, 1,500 kilometers to the south. And so turquoise luxury good is heading south. It's a very valuable trade good. What's coming north is goods coming from, from the south. So copper ornaments, me uh, metallurgy is starting in Mesoamerica. Copper ornaments are coming north. Um, the people in Chaco Canyon and also the Hohokam and also Pakime, they did a lot of artwork with feathers. So what they wanted were these birds. So these are scarlet macaws. And they're not carrying just the feathers. They're carrying the live birds. So they're walking through the desert. You've got a, a bird cage on your back. And you're trying to get these birds alive, reasonably healthy, up into Chaco Canyon. You can see they're incredibly gaudy. You can imagine what artists would be doing with them. And another thing that's also coming north is, is if you're a chocoholic, you come by honestly. Chocolate beans. Uh, cocoa beans are also coming north. At that time, they were drinking it once in chocolate bars. But people in Chaco, it's not just the nobles who are drinking hot chocolate. It's also commoners. So it's in enough in enough demand that they're actually finding chocolate. So they're finding yeah. chocolate residues in the bottoms of pots. So turquoise trail, and then as the little ice age sets in, there's a number of these mega droughts that occurred both taking out the Hokia proper, the drought that occurred at the end of the 1250s, and also the Anasazi and ancestral pueblos are probably severely impacted by the great drought that's occurring around 1295 to 1300. Also at this time, the climate then starts degrading, it becomes colder. It's harder to get a reliable large crop out of maize. And if you want to have these big cities or these big kingdoms, you've got to have a dependable grain source that's always producing a lot. So it fails, or it becomes less reliable. So things uh, die down in the Little Ice Age. All those things are still going on. So a second to the last slide. So here's where Lake Mina is. So the question now becomes, well, what's going on in Saskatchewan? How are people in Saskatchewan? We mentioned a bit and talked a bit about what's going on with the droughts and how people adapted to the droughts or didn't adapt to the droughts. But what's going on with the Little Ice Ages in Saskatchewan? So if we head off about 1,000 kilometers to the northeast, we get to North Flat Lake, where we have a pollen pour from. So North Flat Lake is right there. Mina's down here. And what we see in the pollen is, is we have a very warm and dry first millennium AD. And then around 800 AD through 1400, we've got a medieval warm period. It's warmer. It's a lot drier. Or not, it's, it's a lot wetter, not drier. It's, it's a lot wetter. It's warmer. The ancestors, the Arakara and the Hetmanda and the Fidatsa, are farming maize in Manitoba. That becomes possible in the medieval warm period. Then around 1400, we step into the Little Ice Age. It becomes much colder and drier. So with this transition from the, into the colder, drier conditions, the Oneota, who are farming maize in Minnesota, they give up on maize farming, <coughs> and they move, west onto the, they move west onto the prairies. They become the Sioux and start and start following the bison for their, for their sustenance and to feed their children. In Saskatchewan, that's when we have the movement of the Cinnaboyne coming out of the, the eastern woodlands, moving onto the prairies. Once again, making your living in the eastern woodlands or that uh, ecotone area, it's no longer really successful. The bison are, is, what's, is what is important and what is reliable, and people start living according to the bison and following the teachings of white buffalo calf woman. So that's just where I'd like to leave it. And just so we're somewhere here, here's Great Turtle Island. We're right, right around here. We can see both by the instrumental records, by the archaeological records, by oral history, by these proxy records, that this area of the Great Plains it's a very, it experiences naturally a very variable climate. It's not as steady state or as calm as the Europeans thought in the last uh, 100 years. It's extremely variable, and now with global warming, we're adding another layer of extreme variability to it. So we must stay adapt. We must stay adaptive, and that's where I'd like to leave it.